tonight, the Veil Nebula, same scope, same target, same night. We're gonna take this full spectrum modded, pretty old DSLR, and we're gonna compare it to a modern cooled one-shot color. This is about as good as you can get for APS-C right now. So let's see what we see. For Team Classic, we're going with the Canon Rebel T1i. I did do a full spectrum modification on this a long time ago. Um, it's got 15 megapixels. It's about 4.69 micron pixels. It doesn't have any cooling. It has no amp glow control, but it does have an APS-C size sensor. This is going up against what we'll say is team cold and bold. This is the ZWO ASI 2600 MC Duo. This is about 26 megapixels with 3.76 micron pixels. It has a regulated cooling system. It has low read noise, zero amp glow. This one even have, has a guide sensor built into it. That's what makes it the Duo. And you can see both of them there. But importantly, this is also APS-C sized. So these sensors are about the same size. Let's go over some of the fairness rules real quick. They're gonna be connected to the same scope, which is a RedCat 51. This has a 250 millimeter focal length. Pop that cover off, there you go. And it's uh, f4.9, so it's pretty quick. Uh, it's a nice little scope. These are great uh, for wide fields, uh, even if you're using things like the Canon camera, uh, if you don't have autofocus, because they have this really nifty batten off mask baked into them right here in the lid. So you just take this cover off and you can do your focusing that way. Uh, this one does have the ZWO electronic automatic focuser, EAF, and it's mounted with this really trick bracket um, that I ordered from someone off cloudy nights. I'll have to find their information and throw it into the description below. Um, and it's going to be all guided with a William Optics Uniguide 32 120 millimeter. So this is a 32 millimeter aperture, 120 millimeter focal length. And that is attached to a ZWO ASI 290MC. This is for the guiding. Now, to keep things fair between them, uh, there's, it's a pretty moonful night. Um, so they're both gonna be running the same filter. This is the SV220 dual band. Um, they'll both get it. SV gives you, uh, SV Boney gives you this nice little chart showing you um, the transmission rate and the wavelength. These are seven, this is a seven nanometer band pass filter, which is pretty wide. Um, but it's still a really nice filter to use, especially on nights like tonight when the moon is out. It's not full, but it is out. And uh, we expect there to be maybe a little bit of clouds. I don't know if this will necessarily help, but it should be good. Each camera is gonna be taking 240 second exposures, which we refer to as subs. Um, we're gonna give them about the same total time and we're gonna do identical processing in Cyril. We're gonna be using a lot of uh, funny terms uh, today and I wanna sort of go through what some of those are. There's SNR and SNR per hour. Uh, SNR is the signal to noise ratio. And if you take that and divide it by um, how long the exposures are, you get SNR per hour. So it's signal to noise ratio normalized uh, to a one hour integration. Uh, integration is uh, how much exposure in total was there for that final stacked image. We're also gonna be talking about, and I think the big story with these is probably gonna be QE or quantum efficiency, which is, um, you know, if you think about these cameras, what they essentially are is a grid of, I guess, small buckets. And these buckets catch photons. And when you read the photo out, it tells you how many photons landed in that bucket. Now, not all of the photons that you know, make it to that bucket actually end up being registered. And that difference is called a quantum efficiency. So you want as high a number as possible for quantum efficiency, because that means it's counting the most of the photons it's receiving. Um, and so it's determined, or it's uh, read out as a fraction of photons that become electrons. From my rough reading, the 2600 MC uh, sort of whole family, that's the duo and the air and the color, 
Uh, all the color ones seem to have a QE of about 81%. So if you throw 100 photons at each pixel, um, it'll register about 81 of them. And the DSLR is a little bit less. Um, from what I've been able to gather online, just looking at various forum posts and some lab results, um, the QE seems to be about 30%. So for every 100 photons you throw at each of the pixels, it's gonna register 30 of them. That's not great, and I think that's probably gonna be most of the story of what we're talking about here. Um, we're also gonna talk about things like read noise and thermal noise. Um, these are sort of noise patterns that get added to the picture that you take that aren't like sky glow. So read noise just comes from reading out the image. There's uh, sort of a randomness that happens there. Um, and then thermal noise is occasionally heat uh, gets registered as a photon. And so it shouldn't affect the 2600 uh, MC because it's got all of this as a thermoelectric cooler and the DSLR has none of that. So I think we'll see sensor temps on the DSLR get really hot while this thing will sit at negative 10 uh, degrees centigrade all night and not even complain. We're also gonna be talking about FWHM, which basically just means star size. It's full width, half max, it's a statistical term. Um, but think of it as star size. Uh, we might also use terms like RMS, um, which is sort of, we're gonna talk about, when we talk about that, it's gonna be like the wobbliness in the guiding. And we might mention things like dithering, which is tiny offsets, because sometimes your guiding can be too good. And uh, you need these tiny offsets that help kill some of that fixed pattern noise um, that comes in through each of these sensors. So now uh, let's get all this put back together. And then tonight we'll take it outside and hopefully we'll be able to get all these images in one night on the same sky. That's the plan. So I'll see you out there. All right, so we're out here. We just finished up imaging with the 2600 MC Duo. The filter's basically inside the telescope, so we're not gonna have to take that off. We're gonna do a quick camera swap. Um, we're still guiding with the Uniguide 32 with the ASI 290 um, as the guide camera. Everything else is gonna stay the same. Uh, the sky conditions have remained pretty similar. So let's go ahead and swap this out and let's see how that goes. It's the next day, a uh, little bit of disappointment. Um, I was struggling with the DSLR connecting to Nina, basically the sense I plugged it in. Um, I could take, I could do uh, like plate solving and autofocusing. So all those short exposures are working fine. All right, I'll check back in uh, tomorrow or tonight, hopefully when we get the DSLR running, I may switch over to the ASI Air for control, just because this whole thing was a kind of a nightmare. And I wasn't sure whether to keep this in the video or not, but I feel like this is part of the story with DSLRs. All right, so night two actually went really good. It started out a little cloudy and I was worried we weren't gonna get another night of imaging. But um, by the time we actually got out there, it cleared up. And so I was able to get everything set up and I took what I learned the night before and I just used APT to do the whole thing. And um, yeah, so let's start looking at some of these results here. So starting with this image here, uh, I think probably pretty easy to guess. This is the image that came out of the DSLR. You can see it's pretty noisy. There's some detail there though. Um, it's not bad for 90 minutes, but if we compare that then to this image, which is from the 2600, you can see the 2600 got a lot more detail, especially in that sort of middle filamenty area. I'll blink these back and forth a couple times so you can see. Um, some of that might be sensitivity to certain wavelengths, but I think a lot of what we're seeing here is just that quantum efficiency. So I might follow this up with a quick uh, video to see what happens if we shoot three times as much data with the DSLR. Like, can it actually get close to this? Um, let's zoom in a little bit on one of these areas. This is the one shot color here. 
and you can see there's noise in the background. It's not a perfect uh, image. It is only 90 minutes. But then when you switch over to the DSLR, all the detail sort of goes away. Um, all of that sort of signal, I guess. So we'll blink that one back and forth a couple times as well. Um, and let's put some numbers behind all of this. So what you're seeing now is uh, the mean brightness of the brightest parts that I could find of each image. I created a little rectangle uh, within Cyril and then asked it for the statistics. For the 2600, the mean values, uh, and you can't really compare them directly to each other, but just so you can see it here, it's uh, 590, 702, and 541 for red, green, blue. Um, the mean values in sort of the same patch of sky uh, for the DSLR was 1123, 1162, and 1116. And yes, technically the number is higher, but you'll see in a second why uh, that sort of falls apart. So <clears throat> next up is a sort of what should be, quote, a dark patch of sky. And for this, we're gonna take the median, um, and it's 1090, 1135, and 1097. This is for the DSLR. And here it is for the one-shot color. Uh, the median is 483, 602, 487. And so this is um, sort of the brightness of the what should be a black patch or dark patch of sky. Um, to make sense of it a little bit more, um, here's this graph. And so the columns are the DSLRs, signal to noise ratio per hour, the one shot color, signal to noise ratio per hour, and then the comparison between the two. Um, and so the signal to noise ratio for the DSLR on average was about 3.84. Um, and for the one shot color, it's about 12.14. So um, between the two, on average, the one shot color gets three times more signal to noise, um, which makes sense because when we were talking about the quantum efficiency of those cameras, um, you know, it goes from 30 to 80 percent, 30 percent on the DSLR to 80 percent on the one shot color. So it's not exactly three times, um, but it's pretty close. And what we're seeing in the data lines up with that uh, dif uh, distinction in uh, quantum efficiency. That combined with more thermal read noise on the DSLR because its sensor was at about 95 degrees Fahrenheit most of the night, even though it was a cool night. And the 2600 was at a stable negative 10 degrees uh, C. The 95 Fahrenheit for the DSLR, or that was in Fahrenheit. Um, so between just thermal noise, uh, but I think the bigger player here is just the quantum efficiency of the sensors. And so that's, yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, this is what the final-ish image looked like with the one-shot color uh, 2600. Um, that's a, it's a really good image. Um, and here's the image with the DSLR. It's less good. I think you could probably take care of some of this banding with flats, but not all of it. Um, so like I said, I'm going to do a follow-up. I'm going to probably shoot another couple nights with the DSLR and see if I get it three times as many subs um, that are the same length will the SNR catch up? So expect to see that in a, in a future video or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I guess the conclusion here is if you've got a DSLR sitting in a drawer somewhere and you want to get into deep space astrophotography, um, you can totally use it. It just won't be as efficient in how you're spending your time outside. Um, the 2600 seems to pull detail out of the night sky about three times faster. Um, but, you know, that being said, so you gotta shoot a couple extra nights. That T1i, the one that I used, first of all, there are more efficient DSLRs than that. Um, but that one that I used, you can find for sale for less than $100 um, versus that 2600, which even a used one, not duo, just a regular one, you're probably looking at at least a thousand. Um, so I don't know that it's 10 times better. The data says it's only three times better. And uh, yeah, so really just use whichever one you've got. Um, you can totally get by with a DSLR, but that 2600 is gonna just buy you uh, SNR way faster. So with that, um, let me know if there's anything else, uh, any lingering questions after watching this that anyone might have. Uh, for Deep Sky Labs, I'm Francisco. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe 
um, and drop me a comment below. What was your first astrophotography camera? Was it a DSLR? Did you get a, a nice cooled astro cam? I'm really interested to know uh, what your first astrophotography camera was. Uh, thanks and clear skies.